This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Welcome, welcome to episode number 49 of Tiger's Talk with Chirko and Company. I am your host, Vito Chirko, alongside my usual sidekick and partner in crime, the doc, John Macaroo. I am Smack Talker Skywalker, and I got a mic saber for a hater. But I can't hate on you, Vito. You had yourself a great weekend, and I'm very proud of you. I have to start off this. Is this the 49th edition of the Episode 49, one podcast? away from week number 50 of doing this Tigers Talk podcast. Isn't it something? I have to give you props, man. You had yourself a big weekend marked by your charitable softball game. Adam and Lorraine went out there. They said it was first class. Everyone that went out there had a good time. I'm now starting to see the pictures on Facebook and Twitter. And then you got to go on the podcast Alanos show. It was very cool. And uh, it was nice to hear you kind of just being in your element, relaxed, kind of talking about Pokemon Go, talking about other things. Well, that's something a little bit different for me, too. Indeed, Doc. Yeah, it was nice. You you were probably relaxing on the phone, just kind of going. And uh, I thought you'd be like a... Uh, you know, a regular segment, like 15 minutes. You went the whole hour. You I co-hosted know. it. I was, co-hosted it, yeah. And I listened to it Monday morning. It was awesome. You did a great job. And people are starting to now recognize the tweets are coming in. The Facebook messages are coming in. People are liking what you're doing. And I really respect the fact that you put together a charitable event. And within almost a day or two, you met a lot of your goals financially to contribute to Make-A-Wish. And the event, my goodness, what was it like putting together a charitable event? softball game well first and foremost thank you for the very kind words you're well respected and i think the game was well respected the turnout was great it was great weather in southfield at ingle nook park first time being there but a great facility great complex the diamond was in great enough condition to play the game and we had about nine to eleven about ten eleven players per team and then we had family members friends come and spectate and donate money large amounts of money for me doing this for the first time ever my first ever charitable endeavor and we raised over guess what doc over a thousand dollars we raised for the second annual Chirco and company softball game and the first one designed for charity and we raised money specifically for make a wish the make a wish foundation of michigan so I was very proud, and you know what? I would love to make it bigger and better for next year and to plan it even more well ahead of time and to get you there, get your butt on the diamond playing on the infield or in the outfield because I want to see how good you are at playing softball too. Because I saw Adam, and he was pretty good, and his wife played as well and gave a ton of effort, Lorraine, playing catcher and Adam in the outfield. Nice. And so, yeah, to talk about that for a second, the gauntlet, a challenge has been thrown my way. I don't know if you got a chance to check in and peek into the Motor City Sports Ramp podcast, but we were talking and Jason said that, hey, you know, he was in the batting cages and I was just like talking all, you know, with some bravado. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I could hit 70 miles an hour in the cage. And he didn't believe me. So it's going to happen at some point in the next couple of weeks. Jason, the King Jarvey, and myself are going to go out to probably C.J. Barrymore's and we're going to put me in the batting cage and see if I can hit 70 mile an hour fastball one good Hit. That's all I got to do. One round. Is it just making contact or actually hitting like a line drive, you know, up the middle at the, you know, exactly. the batting cage? I mean, he, he believes that I could not make solid contact okay. with anything 70 miles an hour. And I said, oh, I think I can do that once or twice. I might whiff or so. But once I get into a rhythm, I'm going to smash the hell out of the baseball and I'm going to collect me a free lunch. So that's that's one thing. And second, yeah, I for sure I will get out there maybe next year. If you do it again at the same spot or you do the same, something similar, I will always try to help you out, especially if you're going to do something for charity and especially for Make-A-Wish. You did a good job. And so you uh, have you always done a lot of charitable work? Is that something First you're First time doing a charitable endeavor. And I'm glad to say that you raised $100 for me in the Make-A-Wish Foundation of Michigan. Was glad to see that. It made my night on Friday night of last week. Seeing that, and then the Tigers won, obviously, too. So seeing that and your donation on the online fundraiser page for Make-A-Wish was great to see for me and made my night this past Friday night, Doc, to say the least. And then, not only was Saturday great for me, and, you know, the Tigers lost, 
They did, though, on Saturday, but they won the series, won two out of three against the defending champion, KC Royal. So I had a great weekend doing my charitable endeavor with Make-A-Wish on Saturday in Southfield, Michigan at Ingle Nook Park. Great turnout, like I said. And then a great showing by the Tigers over the weekend in their first three-game set, first series of the second half of the 2016 campaign. They beat the Royals in the fashion that I thought they would. They beat them two out of three and won the two games that I thought they would, too. It was a great series win, marked by... Obviously, whenever you get a walk-off home run in that fashion, Salty just destroyed the baseball. And what made it extra sweet was, you know who it was off of? Soria. I know. And the so, former Tiger. That was great to see, too. It's nice to see a guy that used to kind of maybe give us a little bit of angst go to another team and throw us a nice meatball. And Salty's been a nice addition. But I'm a little bit concerned because are you starting to hear the rumblings that maybe the Tigers at the trade deadline may be looking to catch on to another catcher? Did you hear those rumblings? I didn't, but I could see because I could see why. Let me just say that because of the fact that James McCann has struggled at the plate all season long. And I think we talked about it on Podcast Dianos. I was on there, as you said, appeared as a guest, guest co host to the whole entire 57 minute long edition of Podcast Dianos. I believe episode number 20 for them. This is number 49 for us. A little bit, you know, ahead of the game than Podcast Dianos in episode number. But, anyways, Tigers are behind the eight ball when it comes to catching and catching depth, and their starting catcher, McCann, has not hit, like I said, all season long, and maybe it's mental. That's what we talked about, Jordan Hall and I, on episode number 20 of Podcast Dianos. Whether or not he is beating himself up now mentally and can't get himself rectified at the plate because of that being a factor. I mean, Doc, what do you think about James McCann and his struggles to this point in the season? And we are now in the second half, and at the point in the season where you got to say, McCann might just struggle all season long, Doc. Yeah, it's a little bit disappointing, right? Especially when you see a guy like Salty. I know Salty is his, not hitting for average like we would like, and he's only a backup, only playing once or twice a week. James McCann, somebody that we should talk about and look at, he's a great defensive catcher. He's coming into his own. He's a guy that can definitely keep runners at bay. I don't believe runners are really stealing as much as they have in, in previous years. And Avila was pretty good, too. He was good, though. They both can throw out runners. Exactly. But they both... You know, Avila couldn't hit towards the end there. After 2011, made the All-Star game, came out of nowhere like Matt Noakes did. In what year? 1987. Hey, Marlo, by the way, Marlo Alter gave me some feedback on that podcast. He listened to it. He loved that part of the podcast last week, all the trivia, and loved that you got stumped and loved the fact that nobody could really give me the over-under of three games, whether or not the Tigers could win over or under three against the Indians the rest of the way this season. That was laughable for Marlo and for us, and we got a, a big-time laugh out of that on episode 48 last week. But anyways, McCann is a worrisome factor for me the rest of the way. His hitting is just, I don't think, going to be there. It's not. We know that at this point. And then, you know, Jared Salchalamakia, love his last name. We call him Salty. Big-time power production. And clutch, he's got the clutch factor going for him, huh? All season long with these clutch bombs. On Sunday, getting it done when it counted the most. A walk-off home run against, out of all the guys it could have been against, in you know, the Royals' bullpen, it was against Soria, the former Tigers' closer. So that was great to see. And Salty has that ability in his potent bat for that power production. Thing is, he can't hit for average enough or really feel the position superbly enough to start every single day behind the plate, Doc. So they need another catcher, but they realistically need a starting catcher. Salty Lamaki is a great backup, and that's really what he is. We know what he is at this point. And you play him too much like they kind of did when McCann was hurt in the first half at the beginning of the season. But when you play Salty too much, you get a, a less impactful Salty at the plate. You don't want that to be the case. That's why you got to go out and get a starting catcher then, perhaps. But that's kind of the least of my worries. When you look at the Tigers' rotation and them throwing out a guy such as Anibal Sanchez, the worst starter right now in all of big league baseball, in my opinion. And I think even statistically, it stacks up to that. So Okay, so here's the rumor that's going around. Yeah, hit me up. Okay, the rumor is that Fox Sports is predicting that the Tigers may go after Brewers catcher Jonathan LaCroix. And when you look at the numbers combined for McCann and Saltilamacchia, they're really bad. Um, combined, they're batting for around 200, about 14 home runs and 50 RBIs in about 105 games combined. LaCroix is a, a guy that a lot of people are ranking very high, and his, his numbers are pretty good this season. And so... This is a catcher that the Tigers may target and may need to insert there if McCann can't continue to you know, maybe get out of this uh, hitting slump. Well, and then I don't even know about the catching depth in the minors. There's nobody that can come up right now and take the place of McCann. They don't want to send him down because he's too good defensively, and they don't want to ruin his confidence level going into next season too because that could stunt his growth as a hitter, as an all-around catcher. So they won't do that to McCann. But maybe would the Brewers want him in the deal? 
would that allow us to garner then the services of Jonathan Lucroy, this guy that's been an all-star catcher for the Brewers in the past? And hitting this year, I believe I just saw him, baseball reference, at 303. And he has been an all-star, a guy that can hit. So an offensively productive catcher, which we don't have right now in our arsenal. So that would be an upgrade over McCann and Salty Doc. He's 30 years old, two-time All-Star. Right now is batting around 303 with 12 home runs. So that's an interesting point of view in that what would you do in that in that position because how would that affect James McCann? Because I are, think they are, trade him. I are, think they trade him. Then are most people God. viewing McCann as being kind of a captain in, in, in weight, that a guy that is going to be a, le- a leader on this team? I mean, once he, once he kind of got in Iglesias' face, he's kind of been a vocal leader, a guy that many believe is you know an up-and-coming star that maybe has potential, just needs to kind of work things out and get to that point where he can be a consistent hitter. Well, maybe he was the best manager on the Tigers in the clubhouse last year. Okay, maybe he had that going for him, but still hitting the baseball he's got to do to be the starting catcher. He does. Luke Roy can do it. But the thing is, what's the price tag of the Brewers for Luke Roy right now? Is it McCann and then somebody else or two other prospects? Or is it two, three middle tier to higher end prospects? Tigers don't have that in the farm system. So I don't think the Tigers are well equipped enough to deal for LaCroix right now to get a deal done before the deadline, which is August 1st this year. Yeah, which I believe catcher, I mean, is an area of need, but it's not the pressing need as opposed to the top two, whether it be pitching or bullpen. I think that the bullpen is something that's kind of rounding into form. You've seen in the first game versus Minnesota, you've seen he went to Wilson, I believe Green, and then... For- it was Green, Wilson, and then K-Rod did come in and got the save. It looked and I loved, efficient. I loved what K-Rod had to do. I believe it was Sunday, came in in a tied ball game, two runs apiece before Salty at that home run in the bottom of the ninth. It was Sunday. He put him in in a tied ball game. Osmus. Got to give some credit, huh, to Osmus for doing that. He doesn't do that very often. No, I think that uh, right now the Tigers are kind of in a situation where they're not playing great teams. You know, you can't give them all that much credit versus Minnesota. Hey, you get the win, you beat them, a team that was coming in, hitting the, the tar out of the baseball, scoring a lot of runs, but just overall not a good team. You, I mean, it, when Matt Boyd can get you, you know, and you win the game one nothing, something's wrong there. And, that, and basically Minnesota's in turmoil after firing their general manager. They are looking to sell off and really kind of start over. So you got to take advantage and really crush Minnesota, and I think that's why a lot of people are anxious regarding uh, regarding the appearance of Anibal Sanchez in Game 2. Like, are you going to give up 10 runs today? Are you going to have to score 12 and get a 12-10 victory? Or can you at least do what Boyd did and just give up a couple runs and let this offense take care of business? So I guess I want to, you know, kind of ask you this, is that do the Tigers really need to target a catcher? I mean, you could improve in several areas, but getting a catcher, I don't, I don't really think that's going to be the, the target. No, because they need starting pitching depth. And they don't have a, a huge amount of prospects in their farm system that they can just deal for all these positions of need. So the catcher position, they probably have to resolve that need in the offseason, in my honest opinion. Now, starting pitching, they're going to get that. They're going to upgrade the starting rotation before that August 1st non-waiver trade deadline, in my opinion. That will be the biggest area of need that they go out and acquire before the deadline does occur on August 1st. And what will they acquire? Well, maybe Rich Hill who's 36, maybe a lower-tier guy that can be a solid third or fourth starter. But realistically, that's still an upgrade, even at his advanced age. And even though he only had, like, four starts last year with the Bosox and has come on this year out of nowhere at the age of 36 and is a risk because of that age factor being taken into account. Even with all that said, though, Doc, he's an upgrade over the likes of Anibal Sanchez and Matt Boyd. And Boyd went out, got it done Monday night against the Twinkies, a team that he should have gotten it done against. Come on. They just fired their GM, right, for obvious reasons. They stink. They stink right now, the Twinkies. And they've declined. How about their year last year where they overachieved, and now everybody can say that. They proved all the, the people right who claimed the Twins overachieved last year by going 83-79. and 79. That's how good they were, over 500. And they finished second in the AL Central to the mighty, tough KC Royals, who won it all in 2015. So that's telling them how far they have fallen under second-year skipper Paul Molitor, Doc, to say the least. But once again, Rich Hill, huge upgrade over Boyd even right now, and Anibal Sanchez. And Sanchez going Tuesday night, the day, the night of this recording, so we're not going to be able to see or, you know, recap his results. But we can still predict, give a prediction, and we can see if we're right when we listen back to this podcast, whether or not Anibal Sanchez can get it done against the Twinkies. I'm going to say even though this would be the perfect opportunity for him to get a W, I, I think he gets another loss. Tigers lose Game 2 against the Twinkies Tuesday night. And I think it's also because of the fact that the Twinkies can still hit and hit for power specifically. And that's how their offense is produced. 
to a large, large degree. Brian Dozier at second base can hit for power. Second-year pro, Miguel Sano. Those guys have continued to hit for power as they did last year. They had 14 home runs apiece going into the All-Star break. And the club's alone All-Star this season, Eduardo Nunez, was a pleasant surprise in the first half with a 321 batting average, 12 homers, and an 836 on-base plus slugging percentage. Your prediction for Anibal Sanchez, Game 2 against the Twinkies Tuesday night. Will he get the W? I'm going to say no. I'm going to hope for, at best, a no decision. I think he'll go five innings, give up three runs. It'll be 3-3 three to three when he comes out of the game and hopefully get a little bit of confidence. You know, it's just one of those situations when, where we can talk about it week in, week out. Pelfrey, Sanchez, and Lowe, they're just trying to scramble and work around those guys and their struggles. Those three guys are the guys that you would say, okay, these are the lower end guys on the you know on the roster, and we got to figure out what to do with it. Now, here's the problem: problem is they're they're performing at a terrible rate, but their paychecks every couple of weeks are very nice. And so the question I asked Jason, you know, the other day, and the, the question maybe I'll ask you is, do you think that they're getting chance after chance just due to that contract, or what on earth would would cause you to put them out there? You know, that game versus, you know, Sanchez's last appearance was terrible. He gave you no chance to win. Pelfrey's last performance was unacceptable. Lowe's been inconsistent, giving up a ton of home runs. And so I believe that Brad Osmus would be inclined to no longer utilize them. Let them just kind of go back to the bullpen or do some things with them, skip some starts. But I really feel like there's a message coming from above saying, hey, hey now, we're paying Pelfrey. Hey now, Howard Stern, baby, pulling it out. We're paying... We're paying Pelfrey eight million a year. We're paying Sanchez sixteen, and so you, it's been said time and time again. You can't let contracts dictate what's going on. When you go out there, Pelfrey didn't give you a chance to win. You could have swept Casey. Those are much needed victories that could come and bite you in the butt. So you think that? Well, uh, I'll give Osmus and the Tigers this: they won two out of three still with Pelfrey starting Saturday, so they still accomplished the mission, in my opinion, of winning two out of three against KC, where you have to take advantage of them right now. They're a middling ball club, have some injuries, and the Tigers were at home. They've been great at home. So I like what they did still. But, yeah, they're still taking away from what the Tigers could be. Pelfrey, Sanchez, and whether or not the contracts of those guys are dictating whether or not they get starts consistently going forward, I think it has already shown, you know, reared its ugly head with that being the case. So I, I, I think that that has proven to be a point, that their contracts have proven to be the large reason why they continue to get starts. And Sanchez, you know what, largely based upon that factor on his contract, he would not be getting starts any longer. He would not at all. And Pelfrey, because he was just signed to a contract. So I got to give you that much that I think it's largely based upon that. But then there's also this other factor. You have Matt Boyd and then Buck Farmer, right? Buck Farmer is the other guy you would have to turn to. If you benched Pelfrey to the bullpen, okay, you would have to have Buck Farmer. And you want him in the rotation over Mike Pelfrey? I still actually trust Mike Pelfrey, the Pelf, Big Pelf, the veteran, who's not a great veteran arm, by the way. But I trust him over Buck Farmer because Farmer is disastrous. He's a dumpster fire you know, waiting to happen every single start that he makes. So they don't want to have to go down that route. That's an ugly route to go down. So I would still give the advantage and give the start to Mike Pelfrey over Buck Farmer. And that's why he continues to get reps in the starting rotation. And Sanchez, well, realistically, it's because of the injuries to Jordan Zimmerman and to Daniel Norris. Those guys are expected to miss, you know, this one more start and then to get back into the rotation. So if they do, Sanchez is relegated right back to the bullpen where he should be. And I think he'll showcase once again why he should be in the bullpen against the Twinkies on Tuesday night. Maybe he doesn't get blasted, but the Tigers won't win the ball game, and largely because of the ineffectiveness of Anibal Sanchez on the mound. See, I just can't, I can't be, I can't be in agreement with that. If a guy's not performing, you take him out of the game. Period. But who do you turn to right now with the Tigers? Yep. Listen, who, anybody, who do you want to turn to? Any... Buck Farmer. You want Buck Farmer over Anibal Sanchez? Yes. You, I mean, it's... are you crazy? I mean, I'm not gonna say you're crazy, but I'll give you this much: Are you crazy enough to go here to say that? Buck Farmer should be starting over Mike Pelfrey. How about that? Wouldn't you rather just have someone new in there if they're going to struggle? Buck Farmer, not over Pelfrey. Maybe over the Sanchez, who's no longer the Sanchez, as I said on episode 20 of Podcastianos with Jordan Hall. Sanchez, they have to move on from big time. Pelfrey, I think he still is going to have that spot in the rotation all year long until they make a move for a starting arm that's a huge upgrade in terms of well, Rich Hill, a guy like that would be an upgrade and a guy that they might go out and get, as I said, and a guy that I think they have the pieces for, and especially now because he has a blister on one of his fingers, that could really lessen his trade value. And it would mean that a team like the Tigers, who have less quality prospects on the farm, could get into the mix 
for acquiring Rich Hill. So I think Hill is a big-time trade target, and that would definitely relegate Annabelle Sanchez to bullpen duties. And then Matt Boyd maybe you know, back to AAA Toledo. But Mike Pelfrey, you still got to... You got to think that right now Pelfrey is going to remain in the rotation dock until they make a trade for a guy like Rich Hill. Oh, man. Just, I know you're sad that's a buzz hearing kill. that. That's a buzzkill big time. But you know what? They got to score some runs when I guess Pelfrey starts for the time being until they make that trade, which I think they will sooner than later. And the trade deadline, once again, is coming up rapidly here. So they got to make that move before, or, you know, by August 1st. Maybe are you saying that you're not willing to then take out Shane Green from the bullpen and insert him back into the starting rotation, take one more chance and see if. He might work out there. We talked about that, too, on episode number 20 of Podcast Giannis. I'm giving, like, a shameless plug to Jordan Hall on that great podcast there that he co-hosts. And it was a great time for me on there. We talked about that, about Shane Green going back into the rotation. Well, facts are facts, and the thing is right now with him, he's much better in the pen. So I don't want to relegate him then, or not relegate him, but move him back to the rotation where he has struggled in recent memory, has not been as effective and nearly as sharp with the velocity on a consistent every pitch basis. So I, I would rather have him come in for one or two innings, and especially in the seventh inning, than have him start for five or six and extend himself a little bit too much and then risk injury, but also risk ineffectiveness. Man, Vito. So I'm killing your vibe big time. But the thing is, if you remove him from the pen, who are you putting in his spot? That's once again the question. I don't want Bruce Rondon, your man, in the seventh inning. We, we've seen what he has done when pitching in the seventh inning, especially before the All-Star break against the Indians. At Cleveland, Monday night before the All-Star break, you know, let up that two-run home run to Mike Napoli. That was enough for me out of Bruce Rondon being used in those tight late-game situations. So Shane Green has to be utilized even more often and in that role of the seventh to eighth inning, you know, and he can pitch more than one inning. That's the thing. You can extend him to two because he's been a starting pitcher in the past. And one other point before you get the chance to talk, I'm sorry for talking here a lot, but Alex Wilson, I think if he was more reliable like he was last year when truly he was the most effective relief pitcher for the Tigers all season long because they dealt, remember, Soria to the Pirates. And because of that, you know, he became the most reliable relief pitcher from day one to the end of the season. Now, if he pitched like that this year and, you know, showed more signs of that, in the first half, I think Alex Wilson could realistically perform the same role that Shane Green is right now, and they wouldn't then care about moving Shane Green back to the rotation. But because Bruce Rondon is unreliable, because Alex Wilson hasn't been as reliable this year in those you know later in the game situations, that's why I think Shane Green has to stay in that role in the seventh inning and can't be used once again in the rotation. Okay, well, then I'm not going to give you any more ideas because if you're going to shoot them all down, and you're going to make you like, sound stupid. I'm sorry no. for doing that. You are the doc. Oh, I don't want to make no. you sound stupid. No, 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 no. Listen, this is the Tigers talk with Churko and company. I know my role on this podcast, but what I'm saying is I don't believe in the status quo. I believe in that if you know what you see. And so the question I asked you was, you know, what not not the question I asked you wasn't what they're going to do or what you think is, is a better option. My question was, do you believe that the message that's being delivered is coming from Brad Osmus to keep Pelfrey in? Or do you think that it's coming from Al Avila and the top? Because if it's coming from Avila, it's a problem. And if it's coming from Brad Osmus, it's a bigger problem. Because Brad Osmus needs to know that these guys are not effective and they're costing you a chance. But if Al Avila's telling them, you could kind of say, well, okay, maybe it's based on the contract. We understand that Brad Osmus is being a good team player. But Brad Osmus is making these moves and being really loyal to these guys. That's a huge problem because... If Sanchez doesn't go out and really dominate against an inferior club, then you got a problem. Do you have to DFA Sanchez then? I mean, it's come to this point no. where if you do so bad against the Twinkies, who are, you know, this really horrible team, having all year long, you know, 20-plus games under 500, well, do you just cut Anibal Sanchez? No, he was, he was somewhat effective in the bullpen. Maybe he gets one inning, but and he, he did, you know, start the process of feeling comfortable. I really believe he needs to gain confidence. Once Anibal Sanchez gains a little bit of confidence, then he'll be the guy that maybe, just maybe, will get you some value out of that deal. But as a starter, I think it's done. Yeah. I think he's already spread his wings as far as they can go at this point in his advanced age and tenure with the Tigers. So because what do you think? I think he's damaged goods almost, Anibal. But I know your question was about Alex or Alavila, whether or not he's pressuring Brad Osmus. I think Osmus is still trusting in Anibal Sanchez because of the fact that he knows he doesn't have much else to use. He still trusts in his boy, Sanchi. He calls him Sanchi. He likes the guy, obviously. When you call a guy Sanchi, you probably like the guy, and maybe a little bit too much. 
So I think he just respects him for what he's done with the Tigers in the past to the point that he thinks he still can be utilized in this every fifth day role in the Tigers rotation. Oh, no! We got problems. It's a shame, but Brad Osmus really is Brad Asmus, right? You can't trust in him, but he is trusting in, uh, you know, Sanchez. And that's a problem. That's why you can't trust in Osmus, because he's trust- trusting in a guy like Anibal Sanchez, who is totally unreliable at this point. But once again, my point is you've got to worry about what would be the, the alternative to Anibal Sanchez. And, you know, with Shane Green being moved back to the rotation, what would be the alternative to him? So I know you brought up that you weren't asking me that, but you've got to think of that in the back of your head. Who are you turning to in the place of those guys if they get moved to a different role? Now, if they go out and they only target bullpen or they only target a starter, which one do you think is more of a need where if they go out and get uh, a starter that can eat innings, a fourth or fifth starter that can maybe solidify the top three that we're, we're potentially looking at of Falmer, Verlander, Zimmerman, what do you think is a better spot for the Tigers to target if they only do one? Get a starting pitcher, a guy of four or five, or do you think they absolutely must go out there and address the bullpen to help the team? If they only do, if they only can make one move, what do you think is the, the absolute need, bullpen or starter? The starter is more of a pressing need. Going out to get one is more of a pressing need than going out to get a late-inning bullpen arm. Now, they need middle-inning relief help. They really do. But Alex Wilson maybe can fill that void. You know, can be better in that role going forward. Bruce Rondon, same thing. And Shane Green has kind of helped solidify the back end of the pen. And K-Rod's been so great and magnificent in getting saves every single time he goes out there that really he's helped solidify the back end as well. And Justin Wilson is a good eighth-inning guy enough to say, I don't think they absolutely need a guy for the late innings in the pen right now where they need they do definitely need a fourth or fifth starter and really they probably could use a third starter because you don't know what you're going to get now honestly out of Jordan Zimmerman remember he struggled before going on the DL and now he's dealt with some issues and now this next train is the latest the the latest injury that he's dealt with what are you going to get out of him you know in the second half now of the season so I'm worried about that and the starting pitching depth a lot more than I'm worried about the bullpen depth that's just me doc what is your opinion about this? What is more of a necessity for the Tigers as they look to make a deal going into the trade deadline? It really is a dilemma because what are you going to get out of Norris? What are you going to get out of Fulmer the rest of the way? Is Zimmerman going to come back? Who is going to solidify that fourth and fifth spot? It's a big question mark. You may not need to if Norris does well, if Boyd maybe picks it up a little bit. Maybe you got that solidified, but you're not going to count on them. You're not going to have three you know, guys with less experience go the rest of the way. You need some experience, and that's why a lot of people are throwing around the name Rich Hill. But the the situation... he's not too sexy, though. Exactly, and I don't think the the price to go out there and get him is going to be favorable. So I would say the most reasonable thing you can do, based on the fact that you know there's guys out there, maybe Andrew Miller comes in here. That's a good deal, two years. But you don't need that as much. I don't. Think I would you... love him for the bullpen, hard throwing guy in the eighth inning. Could even be the closer after K-Rod. That's great for the future, but we want to win now, and the best way to win now is by acquiring starting pitching talent that can be an upgrade over Anibal, over Pelfrey, over Boyd, maybe even over Norris, because what are you going to get out of Norris? You're right. Who's been on the DL now? You know, I think a few times this year. So you want to kind of avoid that being an issue going deep into the season. Yeah, the starters, if you got to go out there and get one, I'm not sure who they're going to go target, but if you see that the problem is, what are you going to give up? Are you going to give up an everyday player? Are you going to give up Jimenez? I feel like um, Jimenez, Moya, maybe Tyler Collins are out there. Collins is garbage, though. I know. Now he was hey, he was good over the weekend, wasn't he? For as much as we really hated on him, he got it done Friday night. Got on base, you know, uh, or got that tie, game tying home run Sunday. Got on base before Jared Saltalamakia rocked the house and hit that two run bomb to win it and beat the Royals two out of three. So Collins has done something in recent so memory, Moya but it was a small sample Are Moya and Jimenez the guys then you're just going to have to start including in the trade talks when you start writing the names out? I would say you you got to have Jimenez included. You must have him. And the thing is, do you want him, though, in your own bullpen for the second half of the season? But remember, I, he, I think he was undrafted. He was undrafted, not a top prospect, you know, before last year, really halfway point of last year. So now he is. You have a few other guys Bo Burrows, got a few other youngsters on the farm that could be something, but are they that valuable to attain? Now, they are valuable enough, by the way, to attain Rich Hill. He's like 36. He's not the cream of the crop anymore, but that's a concern with him, and he's had some injury concerns and hasn't started all these games, all these innings until this season, and now you're expecting him, if you acquire him, to pitch even more innings. That's a huge toll on his body at this point in his, you know, the advanced stage of his major league career. 
Because that's why you have to turn, I think, to other alternatives, other solutions for starting pitchers. And that would be turning to the Rays rotation, who we talked about on Podcast Dianos, another plug to them, and on our episode last week. We talked about three guys really last week, or two guys specifically. Drew Smiley, who has struggled, and I think Jordan even said on Podcast Dianos that he has a worse ERA than Pelfrey. So he's struggled big time. Or it's right around there, at least. It's not good. And then Chris Archer hasn't had that great of a year. He hasn't been a bona fide every fifth day ace this season for the Rays. So not that you're looking for a capable guy to lead the staff and be the ace for the Tigers if they were to acquire Archer, but you want something out of him of worth. And the thing is, right now, he hasn't been much of a worth or value to the Rays in their five-man rotation. So getting Archer, is that a huge upgrade? I think it is or will be at some point, but maybe not for this season. So then the next question is, what are you going to give up? And what do you have to give up? And do the Tigers have enough? So really, well, three questions right there. Right? I give you a lot of questions. But I don't think they have enough, and they might not even be willing to give up what the Rays would demand of the Tigers' limited farm system at this point. If you stay with us, maybe there's a $30 million man you might be willing to throw into a trade based upon what we're seeing. Stay with us on the Tigers Talk podcast. We'll talk about a struggling Detroit Tiger and his worth and what we're going to do next with him. We'll be right back after this quick commercial break on episode 49 of Tigers Talk. Looking for team apparel for your high school, your club sports team, or corporation? Then look no further than Top Cat Sales, located on the east side of Main Street in downtown Royal Oak, between 11 and 12 miles. Through founder and former University of Michigan quarterback John Wangler's leadership, Top Cat Sales has developed a tradition of selling and distributing custom Adidas team apparel with the very highest quality and the very best service. Get your organization, school, or club team all in with Adidas today by going online to TopCatTeamSales.com. Once again, the website is TopCatTeamSales.com. And remember, you must follow Top Cat Sales on Twitter at Team Top Cat. Back on episode 49 of Tigers Talk, I am your host, Vito Churko, alongside my man, the co-host of Doc and Jock, as well the flagship podcast of the Detroit Sports Podcast Network, John Macaroon. And, John, we were discussing some trade possibilities and whether or not the Tigers should trade a, a multi-million dollar, 20-plus million dollar man to a team like the Rays. If the Rays, a team like that would be willing to, well, accept his large contract. Now, a team like the Rays, I don't think would, but give us the name now that you had in mind before the commercial break. Well, we were talking before we started, and you're very disappointed, and you got a lot of numbers to back up the argument that maybe, just maybe, 33-year-old Miguel Cabrera is, not, yes. is no longer carrying his weight and might be a guy that maybe, just maybe, needs to be considered a guy that you may let go of. I know a lot of people, when you talk about it, you go, okay, we're going to be on the hook for this guy for $30 million plus, basically for the remainder of his 30s. And what age did we start seeing other guys break down around their mid-30s? Guys like Pujols, guys like David Ortiz, before you know, he started figuring out the fountain of youth. Or um, maybe found the rule age, the PEDs at age 40, I think he is right now. Listen, I call it the magic needle. Whatever you want to call yeah. it. He found the magic needle, and he found it again, I think, this year. <laughs> <laughs> but, he might have, you're right. <laughs> but whatever he's doing, maybe he needs to kind of you know have a lunch with Miggy and figure it out. Because right now, Miggy is, when guys are on base, used to say, okay, Miggy's clutch. But with, with uh, the bases loaded... A lot of strikeouts, ineffective, and he's a guy that's been struggling for the month of June. Now, Brad Osmus has been interviewed, and he's, at, he's been asked, like, hey, what do you think about Miggy? And his response was, damn, guys, he's batting around 290, 18 home runs, 57 RBIs. What's your guy's problem? And he's like, I think that's pretty good. And so I go, okay. I look at those numbers. I go, you know what? That's not really bad at this point in the season, but right now, we're seeing a stretch where he had a really terrible month of June, and he's starting to carry into July a little bit, and he's not been clutch as of late, and we need him to kind of pick it up. And are we starting to see the decline, or do we need to kind of relax and tell everyone to pump the brakes? Maybe not as much as Brad Osmus would lead us on to believe, but I think Cabrera can, you know, come out of this slump. But it has been a prolonged slump now. Look at the month of July, his numbers in the month of July, where he's been a bad Cabrera and not, it's been bad because in this season to this point for Miguel Cabrera because he hasn't been Cabrera-like. So good for other players and, you know, 
it allowed him to make an all-star team still. So all-star worthy slash caliber numbers, but not Miguel Cabrera superstar slugger numbers. And the thing is, to back it up in the month of July through 13 games thus far, now before Tuesday night's game against the Twinkies, and in the 13 games, Cabby is hitting a paltry 205 and has zero homers and two runs batted in only in the month of July. And with an 8 63 OPS as it is right now through 92 games play before Tuesday night's game against the Twins. Cabrera right now is on pace for his lowest OPS in a season since his rookie campaign of 2003 with the then Florida Marlins, not even the Miami Marlins at that point. And that's when he recorded a 793 OPS. And to be fair, Doc, and to all our listeners today, this week I should say, he only played in 87 games though, that 03 rookie campaign with the Marlins, which is the lowest for a season in his career up to this point. So the numbers back it up that he has struggled. But will he come out of this slump now? Doc, I think for me, it comes down to the fact that I think mentally he is battling himself every single night. And because of those mental struggles, he is beating himself up to the point where he can't hit consistently like we've seen Cabby hit. And in clutch situations, late in games, you know, and especially with two outs and men in scoring position where he's hit. A buck seventy something, and it was like one seventy one at one point. I know as of last week, going into the All Star break, one seventy one batting average for Cabrera of all people, with two outs and runners in scoring position. Doc, that is not good at all, and not what we expect out of Miguel Cabrera, who is a future Hall of Famer. So, what's been contributing to his slump? Is it that he has reduced well, just, bat speed? Do you think that he's not able to, you know, maybe get out of you know bad hitters counts, and he's seeing a lot more situations where he's behind in the count? and he's just really struggling with getting getting pitchers to throw pitches that he wants to hit? No, I think it's more mental. He's battling himself mentally every single night. And I wanted to ask you as a psychologist, would you label it as such, and how do you defeat that mental issue going on in Miguel Cabrera, that he's battling every single night, or at least according to my theory on Miguel Cabrera and his struggles to this point? See, I think management is just going with the attitude of, hey, you, we know that you can hit. We know that this is a long season. It's going to ebb and flow. And look at the numbers when you call it a down year. See, the problem is we're comparing Miggy to Miggy. Right, that's he, what we're doing. Exactly. Yeah. So his numbers are productive, but they're not worthy of $30 million of production. So what you say is, okay, you just kind of got to wait it out, wait and see, and you, you would expect in the coming weeks that a professional hitter like Miguel Cabrera, you would expect – that he's going to come around with a flurry of hits and it's going to come around. Because look at a guy like Victor Martinez. He's ebbing and flowing, and 162 games is a long time. So I believe management is thinking, hey, let's just trot him out there. Let's just let him get out of it, make a couple minor adjustments, and he'll get a chance to turn it around. Now, in my opinion, I think that Miguel Cabrera needs to kind of take a step back, look at some film, make maybe a couple minor adjustments, maybe with footwork, with positioning, and then he's just got to be a little bit more selective in terms of his pitch counts. Try to get ahead in the count. Try to get 3-1 counts. Try to get 2-1 counts where you know fastballs are going to be pitched. Try to get situations where maybe he's not guessing so much. You know, when you have confidence, you can see the baseball, it's huge. You know the spin of the ball. You know it's going to be a slider. You know it's going to be a curveball. When you're scuffling, it's super tough. It's like you have no clue. And you're, when you're out there guessing, forget about it. You know, any, any pitcher who has any worth can, you know, maneuver around and get you out. So that's what's going on with Miggy. I think that it's just a combination of his lack of confidence right now and in terms of the fact that he isn't seeing the baseball and he isn't maybe on top of his game reading what's coming next and it's resulting in him struggling mightily. And it's really bad too because he's getting a lot of situations as of late where the bases are loaded, a couple runners on, and I've I've had to actually tweet out a couple times, buzzkill, Miguel's up, inning, inning, double play. You know what's going to happen? You know going to happen at this point? Like you can tweet it out before it even happens out of Miguel Cabrera. Uh, Friday night, late inning situation. He was up 3-0 or in, a, in a good you know moment there where he could have come through with a big hit to really break it open, give the Tigers a lead, I believe it was, with that kind of a situation. And it at least was a situation where he was up 3-0 with guys on, men in scoring position once again, where the Tigers could have scored to run some big runs there. And really, like I said, broke open that game. Broken open that game against the Rose Friday night. And guess what happened to him? Up 3-0, hitters count big time. Well, he actually struck out and met at bat. I mean, that's not what you expect out of Miguel Cabrera. He has not been Cabrera-like. And even when maybe he's had a resort to guessing in the past, I think he's been able to hit more consistently when guessing pitches coming out of the pitcher's hand. More than he has 
to this point. You know, he's struggling with that, with everything. And all around, I think it comes down to mental issues. And I think he's battling the fact that he's pressing because of his lack of confidence in turning it around. He is pressing to turn it around. And when you're pressing as a major league hitter in any professional sport and whatever really you do, whatever occupation you might have in life, I think when you do press, well, then you struggle, you know, with confidence and then with your production, with your results. You know, your results aren't as productive. And that's what we're seeing with Cabby, Doc. I think it is where he's pressing because of a lack of confidence, which has caused him to guess more often. And when he is guessing, because he is pressing, he's not hitting those pitches that he's guessing are coming in as successfully as he has in recent memory, Doc. And what do you think about the fact or that being an issue, him pressing right now? Do you think that's true with Cabby, that he is pressing? And because of that lack of confidence that you had spoken about prior. Well, here's something you got to look at, too, is that Miguel Cabrera is a professional hitter. You expect that this is a guy that can come out of these things. And you understand that sometimes pitchers are really targeting to, sometimes pitchers are really working in their game plan to avoid the big hits to Miggy. And so they're not giving him situations where he can go out there and dominate. That's why you have scouting reports. You got to remember, the other guys are getting paid too. They're scouting him very well, and they're starting to read the tendencies in that, hey, throw him pitches away. Do not, whatever you do, do not make a mistake inside. Do not throw pitches that he's going to dominate. And so these pitchers are very wise. And when you've been in a major leaguer that long, it's a constant cat and mouse game of adjust to these pitchers and adjust to what you're doing in the batter's box. I think that Miguel Cabrera, maybe, just maybe, needs just a couple days rest, observe the game, take a little bit of a step back, just relax, get in the video room a little bit, a little bit extra BP, and it'll all come around. Because just when you, you start to doubt him is when he gets on a massive hitting streak. Remember that. He but, better go on a tear, though, now. He really is. We need him to go on a tear. Right? It's and, needed. A two-week tear or so something. Now, now He's you, due for it. But now you have to kind of ask, are you willing? Because people get angry when you talk about it. Are you willing to start to maybe add Miggy in terms of the name you throw out there to other teams if you want some young talent or you want someone that can help this, this, this year's version? A lot of people say no. A lot of people get heated. But I go, if you can get someone that's an everyday player, a guy that's young, that you can control and has a lot of upside, maybe just maybe you throw in Miggy and see what happens. Because you got to remember, there is a big bat waiting in the lurks, waiting in the wings, coming back from an injury in J.D. Martinez. He could kind of supplant Miggy and take over that production if Miggy's gone. Not on the but who's anymore. playing first base? It always comes down to that for me. The alternative. Who's the alternative solution? You don't have a true alternative solution from within your farm system right now that can replace Mickey at first base who can actually play the position too a little bit. Now, Moya can replace J.D. Martinez. J.D. Martinez would be a trade candidate, a fine one, if Stephen Moya could play the position there in the corner outfield and do it efficiently enough with the glove and then hit a little bit more consistently for average and not K as often, which would mean if he cut down on the Ks, I think getting on base more often and also possibly hitting for more average. Moya, though, doesn't do that. I don't think he is that type of ball player that can hit for more average, can get on base more often, because he Ks. That's who he is. He Ks and hits for power. He's a two-trick, early a one-trick pony, right? I mean, in the positive fashion. The one trick that he can do, that, which is a positive for the Tigers, is hitting for power. And the negative is, well, he Ks, and Ks a little bit too much for him to be, I think, a productive major league starter. And then the glove. He's a defensive liability. He can't judge anything to save his life out there. I don't think he ever reads the ball off the bat very well. Never really does. And that's probably, I think you have to credit that to maybe poor guidance of him, maybe training of him, and maybe he never, because of that, officially learned how to judge balls off the bat from hitters and at any level of baseball. And I think his instincts, you know, have suffered, have suffered the re percussions of that. I'm not learning how to properly field the position and to properly field the ball off the bat of a hitter. But then Miguel Cabrera, back to that point, I know you would like to deal him maybe, and you're more willing than somebody else so at least because of his big contract. Wait, wait, did I, his, I thought I asked. Did I say that? Did I, say I thought that? you were kind of leading on. So I'm assuming and putting words in your mouth a little bit, but it sounds like you're more willing to deal him than, well, at least me. I wouldn't deal him. He's a legacy kind of player now has a legacy contract, will be a Hall of Famer with the Tigers. That's a big thing for the Tigers, who haven't had a Hall of Famer since when now. It's been a long time. All those 84 guys haven't made it. Probably they'll never make it in now, not you know in the normal fashion. 
But the Tigers have won, donning a Tigers uniform right now, Miguel Cabrera. I don't think they'll deal him because of that. Even though he has maybe struggled to a higher degree than he has in the past with the Tigers. And he has. That is true. Facts are facts. Okay, so, so now— That so, is true with Miguel. Okay, is, Meg, is Miggy, in your yeah. eyes, at this point in time, more of an asset or a liability? Oh, he's still an asset. Come on, my man. He's still an asset? Yeah, because okay. what do you turn to at first base? You have nobody to hit or field a position if you okay. trade Miguel Cabrera, who's still a star. That's the thing. Remember, he's still an all-star. Made the all-star game this year. Has great all-star caliber numbers, not superstar caliber numbers. That's the difference. He's not looking like a Hall of Famer, right, or the best slugger of his generation. But maybe we won't see that kind of Miguel Cabrera going forward. But if we still get an all-star productive first baseman in the middle of the Tigers lineup going forward, that's all the Tigers can ask for as he gets to 35 and older. Because they know he won't be the same guy probably when he's 35 and gets over 35, Doc. You have to remember that, too. A lot of guys do decline unless you have that magic needle, as you talked about, as Big Poppy might have found in his luggage somewhere in the, the Bo Sox clubhouse before this season started. See, I think athletes now are going towards the uh, magic porridge, not so much the magic needle. They're, I think they're trying to find uh, the, the the athletes that are cheating are probably finding it in supplements in their diet they're or doing something. It differently. They, they are. Doing it differently. They cheat the system. Exactly. So, you know, by all accounts, clean player, no, really no history of there hasn't been too much suspicion regarding PEDs with Miguel. So I agree with you. He is still an asset. So I, would you, let me ask you, would you trade him for, you know, a big time young starting arm? See, the couple questions that I still have with the organization is, going forward, are they going to be okay with keeping a $200 million payroll in that neighborhood? Because you got to remember now, you got to start looking at the coffers. Are you going to have a situation where you got, you're paying Justin Upton, you're paying Jordan Zimmerman, you're paying Verlander, you're paying Miguel Cabrera, you're paying Sanchez, you're paying V-Mart. These are six guys, not all making $20 million, but all making $15 million plus, okay? So you can't really legitimately keep all six. But why would you trade Miguel Cabrera of all those six? I no, think no, that's no. a weak option. No, no, no. No, no. What I'm saying is, okay, okay, so if I know that they're going to keep the payroll at that level, okay, maybe then I start looking to Verlander because he could bring you something and you can bring up some of these younger arms or make trades for other guys. But if I know that potentially the payroll is going to start coming down a little bit and that's the philosophy and try to find more guys that can, you know, maybe fill that need but w- w- that aren't making $30 million a year. Then you could say, you know what, maybe you start to maybe see about what you could get for him. Because if you're looking to the future and you're going to scale down into maybe the 150 to 175 range, you got pieces there that you trade off a of Kinsler, you trade off a of Miguel, you trade off a of Verlander, you probably could get 12 guys right then and there, three each. If you trade off other. That's three times three, that's nine, right? Yeah. That, well, Is your math well, off a little bit? No. No, what but, three guys? You're saying, you're saying only three, though, too. So that's Kinsler, yeah. Verlander, Cabrera. Three guys per player? That's nine. Now I'm adding one more guy, okay, potentially. Here. Maybe Upton has to go as well. Maybe you can no the team. trade value, though, right now for anything of worth, right? Justin Upton really doesn't carry much value right now. Now, Verlander does right now. I mean, they really probably should consider trading him if they were to sell. They're not going to. They shouldn't sell. But they probably should because Verlander's value is sky high once again, like it used to be because of what he's done for, what, the last, you know, last year, really since midway, the midway point of last year, he's been a very productive starting pitcher and the best in the AL, according to some metrics. So Verlander has that trade value. Kinsler does too. He'd be an interesting guy, a guy that I thought they should have dealt in the offseason if they would have dealt him. But Mm. now you're contending. You're five games over 500, two and a half games back of a wild card spot, a position you want to be in. You're not going to trade off players now. Now in the offseason, if they fail in the, you know, this season and they look to maybe retool even more, that's when you deal these guys then, if they continue to have productive seasons. So in the second half, Verlander keeps it up. If Kinsler does, that's when you trade Kinsler, that's when you trade Verlander, in my opinion. And Miguel Cabrera, I think, I just don't think you trade him. And I don't think they really will trade Verlander, by the way, either. He's kind of that legacy deal and player, a guy who's going to be, well, maybe a Hall of Famer, not a bone of, he's not a, a sure fire like Cabrera, but Cabrera... That's why you don't trade him. He's a surefire, like, first ballot Hall of Famer with the Tigers. That's hard to trade a guy like that, Doc. Even though he he hasn't ever won with the Tigers, maybe he's come up short in the postseason, too, which he kind of has. Really has never been that productive in the clutch in the postseason. But he's still Miguel Cabrera. Still going to be an all-star and probably past 35. So it looks like for you, just Jimenez, Moya, McCann, those are the guys that you're willing to let go of. Guys that are at the top end of the uh Guys at the top end of the pay scale, you're going to keep on. So, okay. You're, well, you're, you have to for listen, right now. Listen, Vito is a spender. 
You're, you're going to go out there. I'm and, going out to get the title this year. I mean, I know this people year? don't see it as much. I think they can. Their window is still open. I think until that Upton contract runs out. Remember, it's last next year's the last year of the Upton contract. Then he can opt out. I think they have a window until 2017. Okay. I, I know I'm really optimistic. I know, but look at, they have played well out of the break. Now, the Twins don't mean anything. They might sweep the Twins. That means nothing, truly. But what they did against the Royals, Doc, that was impressive. And how they scored two runs there on Friday night. V-Mart, that single, he got to first base. Still barely got to first base, by the way. But winning a game like that, that's a game the Royals win, by the way, usually. I'm optimistic that maybe they can come out here and do some damage and do some things. But you really got to look at adding a lot of pieces and things like that. But, okay, you're willing to keep Miguel Cabrera. I hear what you're saying. And let's just all hope. We all want Miggy to come back and do his thing and be a productive player on the team. That's for sure. That's what we're all hoping for. And you know what? How about V-Mart scuffling too of late, Doc? It's not just Cabby, but V-Mart, another middle-of-the-order veteran bat who has struggled of late. I believe he's had two hits, something like that, in the last eight games played with the Tykes. That's not good out of V-Mart either, something that they need to improve. Now, are you concerned about his second-half production and going on a downswing with that production, Doc? Did you hear what uh, Wojo called him? He called him Kmart. He's like, uh oh, what happened to V Mart? Our guy Kmart is uh no longer being productive and uh I'm like, Oh boy. Well, V Mart, like I said, going through the rigors of uh another major league baseball season. He has dipped off a little bit, but I I, I think that he's been clutch in the past and I think he's gonna come around. We just gotta wait it out. I'm not as concerned about V Mart. I know what we get with him. He's a guy that's I believe a, a professional hitter and his contract is agreeable. Miggy is just on the upper end where you need that like you know, you need a little bit more clutch hits and you need a little bit more production. But let me ask you this now. To play devil's advocate with your thought process of maybe there being a trade partner for Miguel Cabrera and the Tigers getting some youth in the starting rotation, right, in return for Miguel. Well, how about a team such as the Rays, who are a big-time trade partner right now, it looks like for a lot of teams are looking for starting pitching help. The Rays would not take on Miguel Cabrera's contract. you got to find a willing trade partner, a team like the Yankees, the Dodgers, the Bosox, a big-time a market, right, and... If those teams that have the big markets don't have the starting pitch and the Tigers need to upgrade their rotation right now, well, there's no possibility then that you would even consider dealing a guy of Miguel Cabrera's you know, caliber. That's just, th- those are facts. That's a fact right there that you've got to find that willing trade partner too to take on that big time contract. A team like the Rays, a small market ball club in general, are, you know, any of those teams that are small market are not going to take on Miguel Cabrera's contract right now, nor will they ever do so. So, the Rays would never take him on for a guy, you know, for Archer, who would be a, a upgrade for the Tigers in the rotation. But the Rays wouldn't do that, you know. It wouldn't even be a possibility. Now that the Tigers are going to even trade Cabrera, I don't think they will. And I don't think you truly do either. You're just throwing it out there, like you said. And maybe there would be a reason to do so if they knew they had a true alternative once again. So, and if they knew they could get that bona fide ace, they would have to get a bona fide ace starting pitcher, by the way. I think for them to deal Cabrera. Even though they have Fulmer now, but really, for the future, who do they have at the top of the rotation? Verlander's not getting any younger. Zimmerman's not either. It is Fulmer all the way for the future. And, you know, the second half, will he have an innings limit? Now, that's a scary. We've talked about this ad nauseum on this podcast, but we really have to keep talking about it. Superstar quality, Michael Fulmer's box office. He's a guy with presence, and he's a guy that we all are going to look to and say, okay, this guy could be a budding superstar, a guy with good stuff, efficient, gets guys out. The other pitchers kind of give you a little bit of pause and concern, and they have up-and-down innings. Fulmer, as of late, his last five starts, has just been so efficient. And you thought a little bit, how would he handle KC? Because they've seen him now twice. He gave up an early run, but he settled in, and he got through eight innings, and he was just awesome. Didn't even get to 100 pitches. Awesome performance versus Kansas City. And speaking of Michael Fulmer, he, after the game, workman, workman-like duties. He, he pitches strongly, gets a quality start, and was able to help his team compete, and the Tigers eventually won the game, and it was awesome. So then after the game, he heads down to Fanatic U, a great signing, a, a great event with one of our great sponsors. Got a chance to shake his hand, say hello, say what's up. He And we had a lot of support there for your show, the Tigers Talk podcast, and other shows as well, and I got a chance to talk to a couple of our fans out there, and let's just have a listen from the Michael Fulmer signing. I'm here with Dean. This is Doc, Detroit Sports Podcast. He is first in line here at the Michael Fulmer signing. He out here in Frazier. I seen that he was out here, and uh, he's a good follower. And uh, he tweeted us and said, hey, I'm first in line. And Dean, thanks for, thanks for chatting with me. Uh, thanks for uh, 
you know, put me on the air with you guys. I'm very excited. Uh, I'm a big Michael Fulmer fan. You know, I kind of knew he had this in him. If you just start using that change up a lot more, uh, I had a similar feeling with Max Scherzer before he became a Cy Young uh, winner. And, you know, now I'm here in line. I got a game used pitch from him that he threw in, uh, in a game about a month ago. I got a picture for him to sign, and he's here talking to your guy here uh, with his nephew here. I'm just real, real excited. Uh, it's well worth the wait. I've been here for over an hour and just ready to roll. So you got here about 5 o'clock to be first in line? Uh, 4 o'clock. I actually was driving here just as Saltamakli hit the uh, walk-off home run. I was listening to it in my car. How excited are you to meet Michael Fulmer, a guy that might be the AL Rookie of the Year? Uh, insanely, insanely happy, uh, especially, you know, when you might get them when they're young, they're happy, they're energetic, they're very much for fans. Uh, just, I'm a big, big, big fan of him already, you know. As soon as we got him, you, all, you heard all the good things that they said about him. He won pitcher of uh, year, you know, at Double A last year. Even after he came over, he actually did better than he did. So it's exciting to see what else he can bring to the team because, uh, you know, he may just turn out to be just like Verlander. Dean, thanks for joining us. I appreciate you following us. And uh, hopefully when you uh, meet Michael Fulmer, it's a nice si autograph signing. And uh, thanks for your support. We really appreciate it. Always. You can see very windy out there. Wow, Frazier. cars driving by. And was that Dean Palmer? You know who Dean Palmer was? Former yeah. Tigers third baseman. He had, a, been he, Dean had a, he had a natural swing, that Dean Palmer. He did. He had run a, power. Mm -hmm. Big time. Yep. And then we got a chance to talk to a father and son, big time baseball fans. And they actually found us and our podcast network through Fanatic U because they tweet out our stuff. They retweet. Fanatic U is a great sponsor of ours, and they've also get, helped us to gain some followers. And uh, here's a father and son that absolutely love our podcast network, and they were very thrilled to talk to us on our podcast. Doc out here in Frazier. I'm out here with Emilio and Rick. They're out here at the Fanatic U signing for Michael Fulmer out here in Frazier. How are you guys today? Good. How are you? I'm doing good, man. I enjoy talking to the people that are out here looking forward to a signing. And uh, what brings you out here today? Just a great pitcher, great opportunity to meet a great guy. That's right. You guys got here relatively early. That's pretty good. Uh, feeding the line, right? Good thing to do. How long you been a uh, How long have you been a Detroit Tiger fan? Since birth. Since birth. Yeah. Has Dad uh, got you into baseball? Back in the seventies. Back in the seventies. <laughs> yes. Which is one of your favorite uh, Tiger memories? Uh, the old uh, Tiger Stadium. Mm -hmm. Getting sunburned. Getting sunburned. <laughs> okay. What do you think about the 2016 squad? I know we got to be a little bit patient, up and down squad, but a nice, ser nice series win to open the uh, open the start, start the second half. Great. Right. What, what do you think about the squad? You still supporting them? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, it looks good. Good few wins. We got a good vibe going. Hopefully, we can keep stringing it up. Uh, series together. Exactly. and uh, like Verlander came back strong, too. Exactly. And so everyone's got a lot of faith, and you're out here waiting. Uh, have you ever gotten an autograph before or came out to a signing before? A few, yeah. Who's one of the guys you've, uh, you've gotten to uh, meet and get an autograph from? Max Scherzer, when he was still a very young guy. Nice guy. Really nice guy. Reminds me of uh, Fulmer. Very much so. Good. Thank you. Thank you guys for chatting with me. Thanks for talking on the Detroit Sports Podcast. Thank you. Steve Vito, what I got to do is I got to work on, I guess I got to get it from you, is the technique of interviewing. I think I could have put my hand over the microphone. I could have did something different there to improve the audio quality just a little bit. But I'm getting out there, and people are like, sure, talk to me, taking pictures. So I'm getting out there working my reporter skills. Still raw, but I'll get with you and figure out ways to uh, improve my journalistic skills. So you still have to work on those reporter skills. We know that much, Doc, but... That wasn't bad. You know what? B plus quality? Yeah. That wasn't bad. Yeah, Fans out novice, there. Yeah. I'm not a novice. Nah, I know, I know you're not. You've been out there a few times now, actually. I'm less than a novice, man. I'm like an intern. Come well, I'm on. trying to give you the credit, actually, of a novice. But anyways, you know what? Was that Emilio Estevez? I love that name, Emilio. I think of uh, Night at the Roxbury. Emilio, have you seen that movie, Night at the Roxbury with <laughs> no. Will Ferrell? No, it's good. Okay. Must see? Oh, yeah, I love it. It's like a cult classic, like, you know, one of those kind of movies. Will Ferrell, one of his first movies, he was still in SNL. Really good movie to watch. But anyways, you know what could be a really good show is, well, the Tigers playing against the Twins. I said two out of three. Doc, what do you think? Sweep. That's it. Okay. Guaranteed. I think Sanchez will do just enough to give us a little bit of a scare, but it won't be that bad. 3-3, three, three, he'll, he'll get a no decision, and then we'll figure out you know, in, in later innings how to win the game. And that's all we got to do. They're, they're playing better at home. The Twins aren't that good. And I hope, I'm hoping that uh, they get a sweep and go on to – play because i read your article the white Sox. i'm glad you read it from the free press i had the scouting reports for the twins for the white Sox, and really quick before the white Sox, wednesday is a tasty matchup the tastiest of the three game series with the twins irvin santana the best twinkie starting pitcher to this date is going up against a jv and he loves him some twitter that irvin santana he does he's active on there he follows me he does i think he's dm i mean we've like dm'd him when i worked at outside pitch 
we DM'd him about like his free agency status to find out where he was going. <laughs> I think we did. He never responded to oh. us. But he is active on Twitter. I'll give him that much. Yeah. And so is JV. So these active Twitter users mm. are going up against each other. I think JV will get it. Must see JV will be out there. I think. I so. think so against the Twins. He better be. I mean, he, he should. And I think we'll see it on Wednesday night. Is there a Chris Sale matchup coming up this four game? Chris set? Sale and Quintana. Quintana, oh, who's boy. really been the best starting pitcher for the White Sox of late. Now, Chris Sale has a 14 wins to back it up for why maybe he's the best starting pitcher in the White Sox rotation. And he's been this legit ace, you know, for a long, long time now. But Quintana, Quintana is no slouch. He is really not, and it's kind of hard for me to say his last name. I think that's how you say it. And we were talking about Jordan and I, but he said Quintana, so I'm going to say it that way. And I like those two guys that they're throwing out there, but they haven't been able to support anybody. James Shields, Chris Sale in recent memory, meaning the White Sox can't score runs. And really, their lineup one through nine is not very productive. And they don't hit for average. Abreu going into the All-Star break was hitting two seventy two, Not really Abreu-like. Not like his 2014 All-Star campaign. And Todd Frazier hitting the low 200s is all he was hitting going into the All-Star break. Now, still hitting for good power. Was in the Home Run Derby this year. Last year, won the Home Run Derby as a Cincinnati Red. And really got that big-time nickname last year at the Derby which is the Todd Father. I love that Todd Father because I'm the Godfather, right? Or you're the Godfather of this podcast network, at least, Doc. But anyways, to sum all this up, I think— We need two. We need a minimum two We need two. two. I think they get a split for sure. But they could take three out of four because, you know what, the White Sox aren't hitting. So even if Sale and if Quintana really go out there and get it done for the Shy Sox, guess what? They can't score and support those guys. Tigers still get three out of four, even though it's on the road at U.S. Cellular Field, which is not always an easy place for the Tigers to play at, and it's kind of a sandbox for hitters. So the White Sox really get it going. They could score some runs, but I think the Tigers will score more, and they get at least a split, in my opinion, this weekend, Doc. Yes, sir. And so, like Jim Harbaugh says, who's got it better than us? Nobody. Nobody right now. Better than you and I on this podcast, and then better than the Tigers. Weak matchups, but you can always overlook teams and then get stunned. So I hope they don't overlook the Shy Sox, who are still kind of in the middle of the pack. Now, they're falling off, have been of late because they can't score runs, but if they get the match going, if Bray starts hitting for power, Frazier and all that, they can score runs quick then in this upcoming weekend series at the Cell with the Tiger stock. Great 49th edition. And before number 50, how about Buster of the Week? It is for me, Miguel Cabrera. We talked about why he should be Doc for you, your toast of the town for this past week. Who is it? You know what? You know who deserves a toast of the town? Even though it's against a bad team, you still got to give Matt Boy credit. Listen, this is a kid that's been scuffling. He's trying. He had a. He but actually, we all can try. I can go out there and try and get blasted. Listen, yeah, but. He didn't, I know. His Monday performance was outstanding. He got lucky. He was hit a lot, but he got out of the jam and he got the win. And so he's turning the corner. Hopefully it gives him some confidence, and hopefully he can be somebody that can be reliable and evolve into somebody that we can use. So this week, I'll go with Matt Boyd. Good performance on Monday. Toast of the town. And he got a career-high 7Ks? I believe he did. Hey, you so he did rack do up something those pretty, stats versus I'm, bad I'm making teams. you look good, too, with that toast of the town pick of yours being Matt Boyd, and I think he deserves it. Well, based off of that start at least. And Matt Boyd, he's going to go more than likely against the White Sox now this weekend. I think he could do pretty well against the Shy Sox too because they're once again a free-swinging ball club. So what do you think, Boyd? Will he get it done again? Hey, just let's just go one start at a time. You don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, right, with the toast of the town or anything for for a guy like that. One start at a time. We'll see how he does his next start. Sounds like a plan, Doc. And you know what? With that, we will resume our Talk About the Tigers next week for episode number 50 of Tigers Talk with Chirko and Company. Talk to you guys then.